Grace and peace to you, friends. Let me just say thank you once again to Melissa for organizing our World AIDS Day observance today. She even brought a bread snack. And for her friends who shared, who shared her story with us. Um, please pray with me. Gracious God, give us open hearts to hear your words today. Give us strong hearts to live them out. We pray in the name of Jesus, our good, strong brother. Amen. Um, so our story for the book of Daniel is a pretty dramatic one. Um, who knew that they were going to be saying Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego like eight times? <laughs> uh, but you want to get the whole story, right? It's said during the time of the Babylonian captivity when all the leadership of Israel had been forced to go and to live in Babylon. So while in exile, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are working in the city government and they're trying to protect, practice their religion, which includes a prohibition on worshiping other gods besides Yahweh, the God of Israel. You might remember the Ten Commandments, right? The first one is, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Which, if you think about it, is almost custom-made for exactly the situation. The situation in which you are commanded to worship a gold statue that is nine feet wide and almost as tall as a football field is long. Now that is a tall and imposing statue. Right? It's like the Washington Monument or something. And Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego have a choice. They can, you know, go along and get along. Pretend to worship a statue and then later explain that it was their life on the line, right? Which people would totally understand. You do what you have to do to survive, right? Or they can stay true to God, stay true to their faith and to their principles, and they can die. God. They decide to die first before they betray their relationship with God. And Nebuchadnezzar doesn't exactly admire their courage. He stokes up the furnace instead. But the miraculous result is that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego survive. And not only do they survive, but they walk out of the furnace without any trace of their ordeal on them. And the very ending is they get a promotion. So, <laughs> right? Even better. That's right, you get a promotion. All right. And how does this come about? <coughs> a mysterious figure walked with them. Someone's, some of the Christians, looking back, might see as Jesus, the Messiah, God in <coughs> human form, walking with them before he was born into the world. So there are people today who suffer for their faith, who suffer simply because they are part of the people, because they are Christian, Jew, Muslim, because they follow a faith that is not part of the majority in the land where they live. And it might surprise you to know that the largest number of people suffering for their faith in the world today are in fact Christians. There are more of us than anybody else, so that's probably part of it. And it doesn't help sometimes to be of the same faith in a broad sense of the world's superpower. There were, for example, many ancient communities of Christians in Iraq before the U.S. invaded there in 2003. But in the course of the invasion and its aftermath, these Christians faced a persecution that led to many deaths and drove an estimated 330,000 from their home. In one devastating incident, a Chaldean Catholic priest and three de deacons were driving in Mosul when they were stopped. The demand was that they convert to Islam. They refused and they were shot. Staying true to their faith cost them their lives. Now is this all only about religion? Is this a problem somehow limited to Islam? No, to both. There are ethnic factors, there are political factors, these things happen in other countries. But what we see here in the Bible story is that the politics and the ethnicity and the religion are all rolled together. The office, politics, and the court of Nebuchadnezzar are what leads Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego to be put on the spot for their faith in the first place. So the thing that I run up against with this is while there are people of many faiths facing persecution because they're not in a position of power, it's hard to really work up a good sense of persecution myself, right? Sure, sometimes there are things going on in the public square that don't exactly support my values or sense of how things should be in the world, but that's not anything like laying your life on the line for your relationship with God. I was watching Macy's Day Parade on Thanksgiving, and it's a lot of fun. And I don't want to be 100% a Debbie Downer here, but given who sponsors it, and all the fanfare around the arrival of Santa, and I think it was the like the America's Band part of it, where like 
It's America's band, but they're dressed with the Macy's logo. Every one of them has a star in the front of them. Mm -hmm. Uh, that you could kind of argue that this is uh, a nine-point statue to the god of capitalism. <laughs> All the glory and majesty yeah. <laughs> of a busy shopping season <coughs> and healthy economy. Sharon knows what I'm talking about. <laughs> so thankfully, nobody's going to hold a gun to my head if I'm not willing to worship this golden god. If I try to limit my Christmas spending to $100, like the environmentalist Bill McKibben suggests, no one's going to come to my house in the middle of the night to take me away, right? But still, that kind of protest doesn't feel as dramatic as being thrown into a fiery furnace. First world problems, my friend, right? <laughs> the stakes are low. <laughs> of course, I, for one, am very thankful for that, obviously. I pray that none of us here ever has to face a terrible choice like that. And I wish that no one anywhere of any faith would ever have to face it again. But it's not necessarily the case that the stakes aren't still high when the choice is between God and things. It might not be our physical life that is on the line when we pull out the credit card to buy that thing we don't need and can't afford. Mm -hmm. It might not be our bodies on the line when in cash we trust instead of in God we trust. It might not be a life and death choice when it comes time to paper or plastic. But there is a cost to serving any God but our own. To looking for salvation in a store or a bank account. To live hoping that one more thing will be enough. When the truth is that there will always be just one more thing after that. The choice before us is the choice of two different lives. Life in the kingdom of stuff. Or life in the kingdom of God. That life in the kingdom of stuff has done a lot to make many of us much more comfortable a few of us ridiculously wealthy, and left millions more out in the cold. The life of the kingdom of God is about bringing everybody to the table, poor or rich. That life in the kingdom of stuff gives us a constant hunger, a constant desire for more. The life of the kingdom of God is celebrated at a table where we all sit down to eat, to be fed, the holy food of Christ's own body and blood, the Eucharist, the great thanksgiving, a life of gratitude and wonder for all that God has already done. That life in the kingdom of stuff divides us from one another, turning us into units of production, all for the sake of greater efficiency and lower labor costs. The life in the kingdom of God is about coming together as a people and becoming together the body of Christ, Christ on hands and feet, caring for our neighbors with generous love. As it turns out, the highest holy day of the year in the kingdom of stuff happens to coincide exactly with Christians' celebration of the birth of Jesus. I don't know if anyone ever noticed that. But. <laughs> so let's get ready for both of those events by taking care of our neighbors with generous love. This month, I want to invite you to join us at 6 8 in an experiment in living not in the kingdom of stuff, but in the kingdom of God through our 12 days of giving back, which there was going to be a bulletin insert, but there is not. But it will be on Facebook. It is on Facebook already, so it's up on Facebook. And the idea is that on the odd days of December, we find, uh, we decide on somebody that we're going to give back to. Who? A neighbor that we're going to give back to. So our neighbors might be our closest families, or they might be complete strangers. They might be a coworker, a retailer, or literally the person who lives next door. Imagine that, right? <laughs> but let's prepare for Christmas together by finding ways to live in the kingdom of God. That w beautiful world that the baby Jesus grew up to tell us about. A kingdom that is already here among us and that at the same time is not quite arrived. May we encourage each other in our care and may we see that good kingdom all around us as we wait with hope and expectation for a miracle. Thanks be to God. Thank you.